All right, good evening, everyone. It's good evening. Uh, my joy to see you all. Uh, to begin, we'll just go ahead and pray. Sophie Balkney. Father God, um, just thank you again for this opportunity uh, to speak, uh, to preach your message. Um, I just ask that you be with uh, Dr. Joe, Josiah, and Brooke this evening, um, and that you open their ears, mind, and heart, and that they may be receptive to your word. And I just ask uh, that you be with anyone else who may uh, listen to this in the future and just open their eyes, ears, mind, and heart as well. And just thank you for your word and thank you for this opportunity again. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. All right. To start off this evening, I am going to tell you guys a gut-wrenching story. Mm. This story gets me going. Um, it brings me back to my elementary school days, and um, I like to call it the story of the cookie jar. Wow. So, the cookie jar story starts when I was in elementary school. My mom was off grocery shopping, and my dad was off to work, so it's just my siblings <laughs> and myself. Awesome. And we had a <laughs> cookie jar. Now this cookie jar was a nice ceramic jar with a lid and it was it was great. It was a cookie jar. It had all of our snacks in it. So whenever I was hungry, I just asked my mom, Mom, can I have a snack? She said, Yeah, go go ahead and get anything from the cookie jar. And I just snatched and got whatever I wanted. However, this one afternoon, when my parents were gone, and just my siblings and I, I was a little kid back in the day, still am a little. But I was even littler back in the day, so I was reaching up for the cookie jar, and I was I was reaching for the cookie jar. The jar fell, Ooh. and it fell, and it fell, and then BAM! It shattered. Ooh. This cookie jar shatters with Ooh. all of our Ooh. snacks Ooh. in it. And my mom and my dad weren't home, it's just my siblings and I. And so immediately I run downstairs to my room and I cry and I'm crying, I was like, I broke the cookie jar. Mom and Dad are going to be so mad at me. The cookie jar is broken. There's no hope. All hope <laughs> is lost because I broke the cookie jar. And so no joke, I was crying for like an hour straight because I broke this cookie jar. Finally, uh, my older brother uh, sued me through the pain by giving me a fruit roll-up. Those are delicious. <laughs> they can help you with any pain you're going through. Uh -huh. So I was eating this fruit roll-up, and so eventually... I get my courage back up and I go upstairs and hang out with my other siblings and then my mom comes home. Mm. <laughs> and immediately when she walks in the door, I start bawling and goes like, Mom, Mom, I'm so sorry I broke the cookie jar. I didn't mean to, it was an accident. I'm so sorry, Mom, I'm sorry. And then she got off the wooden spoon and she smacked me and whooped me and I was grounded for a week. Yeah. All right, was a that, was a, that was a joke. Oh. <laughs> Instead, my mom, she opened her arms, and she welcomed me with her arms, and she comforted me. She said, it was all right, Kyle. It's all right. It's just a cookie jar. So she forgave me for what I did. And now why did she forgive me? Well, one, it was an accident. It wasn't on purpose. But two, I was truly sorry for what I did, and I pleaded to my mom, Mom, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry I broke the cookie jar, and I was crying and crying. Mm. And so she forgave me. She forgave me because I repented of my action. I was sorry. And so this evening, Brooke and Josiah, we're going to be talking about repentance. <laughs> and to start off, we're going to look in actually two uh, scriptures that we looked at last time I spoke. And it is starting in Matthew uh, chapter 3, the first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 3, it's about two-thirds the way in your Bible. And we're going to start with verse 2. And again, we went over this verse uh, last time we spoke, but we're going to read it again. And starting in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Now she'll start in verse 1. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So here we have John the Baptist, the man who prepared the way for Jesus Christ our Lord. And he began preaching to the people, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if you flip over one page, 
In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it reads, From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hmm. So last time I talked, we talked about Jesus and John the Baptist, their, their message. Their message was about the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was just half of their message, as we see here in this gospel. The other half was repentance. Jesus and John the Baptist preached about repentance. From the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, repentance was the very core of his message. And so this repentance word, what, it, what exactly does repentance mean? A lot of us may have heard of repentance through going to church, but maybe not exactly sure what repentance is. And so the Greek word for repent, and I'm no Greek whiz, but I have three Greek whizzes right here, so you're going to have to correct me on the pronunciation, <laughs> uh, is matanio? Is that right? How do you, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> Matanio. All right, we'll, we'll stick with that. Uh, Matanio is a Greek word for repent. And this can either mean repent, repentance or to change your mind or purpose. Mm. And then according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, repent can mean to turn from sin or to feel regret or, remor or remorse. So for the sake of this message, we're going to say repent. Repentance is a meaning of being truly sorry for your action and then turning away from that action. Amen. So here we have this action, and you need to be sorry for it, and then you need to turn away from that action. Mm. So I believe there are three steps to repentance. Now, unfortunately, the first step is sin. Sin is the first step of repentance. We all need repentance. However, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, he actually did not re need repentance because mm. he was a perfect being. So he did not need to repent, but we do. So sin is the first step to repentance. The second step to repentance is you truly have to feel sorry for your actions. You have to feel sorry for what you've done. And then the final step of repentance is you have to actually turn away from your sin. So first we have sin, then feeling sorry, then turning away from the actual sin. And so we're going to start off with sin being the first step of repentance. Now, how many of you guys have a favorite Bible hero? Mm -hmm. What's your favorite Bible hero, Josiah? Samson. Samson. That's a good man. I like Samson as well. Joe, favorite Bible hero? Daniel. Daniel. Brooke? I guess Joseph. Joseph. All good heroes. Mm -hmm. My favorite uh, Bible hero is David. David was described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. He was a godly man. However, many of us know that David, he was a sinner. He was a sinner. And all of our Bible heroes, other than Jesus, they were sinners as well. David, he had an affair with the man's wife and then had that man killed in battle. Abraham, he lied not once about Sarah being his wife, but he lied twice about Sarah not being his wife. Jonah, he ran away from God and his plan for him. He feared God in the Ninevites, so he ran away. Peter, he denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. Three times the same night he promised Jesus he would not deny him. Peter denied him three times. James, the half-brother of Jesus, he did not initially believe Jesus to be the Messiah. The own brother of Jesus did not believe Jesus to be the Messiah. Aaron, he made a golden calf idol to distract the worship from Yahweh. Yahweh is a jealous God, and Aaron helped contribute to make a golden calf idol. That's ridiculous. Amen. Paul, he zealously, zealously persecuted the Christians, and he murdered many of them. Those are the heroes of the Bible. Those are our heroes. Our heroes that nowadays they'd be set in prison for life. Those are our heroes of the faith. Those same heroes who have sinned. They stood up to God, and they rejected their will for him. These heroes knew what they were doing, but they did it anyways. Hmm. I'm going to tell you guys right now, we are no different from these heroes. Mm -hmm. We all sin. Mm -hmm. And to help illustrate this, we're going to look to Romans chapter 3. Just a couple books over. 
Romans chapter 3, and we're going to read just verse 23. A lot of us may know this verse. But it simply states, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. Our Bible heroes, our leaders, our heroes nowadays, and we ourselves. Everybody sins. We all fall short of the glory of God. This path of sinning is inevitable. And we are all we all have and we all are going to sin. Now that's enough of sin. Second step to repentance is you have to feel sorry for what you've actually done. And however, there are two different kinds of sorrow. And we're going to look in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And again, just a couple books over. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And we're, again, we're just going to read one verse. And here Paul is writing. And here Paul says, For godly sorrow produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly sorrow produces death. So here Paul identifies two separate kinds of sorrowness. The first is godly sorrow. And this godly sorrow leads to repentance, and that repentance leads to eternal life, eternal salvation. However, there's this other kind of sorrow, this earthly sorrow that Paul describes. And Paul says this earthly sorrow, what does it lead to? It leads to death. Mm -hmm. And that's an eternal death that Paul is talking about. And now godly sorrow, uh, I believe godly sorrow is truly feeling sorry about what you're doing because you are disobeying God. God hates sin. And if we truly love God, we're going to be sorry when we sin and when we hurt God's feeling. We're going to be sorry. And that's a godly sorrow. And that godly sorrow leads to repentance. On the other hand, there's an earthly sorrow. And this earthly sorrow, I believe, is when one may fear earthly consequences, such as jail or uh, parental uh, punishment, or other examples are loss of jobs, or um, a baby, or just, there's many punishments that we can have, many earthly sorrows. But this earthly sorrow leads to death. So we need to make sure that our sorrow needs to be godly sorrow. It needs to be a sorrow that we're truly sorry to God, because we really do hurt God's feeling when we sin. Because God, he hates sin. Now to give an example, if you go back to the infamous cookie jar story, <laughs> if I had intentionally broken that cookie jar, an example of godly sorrow would have been that I was sorry to God and my mom, that I did not treat my mom as I would love myself, because we are to love one another, our neighbors, as ourselves. And so that would be an example of godly sorrow, if I was truly sorry. An example of earthly sorrow would be if I feared that whooping that would come my way when my mom heard that I broke the cookie jar on purpose? Are you serious? That is an yeah. example of earthly sorrow, and that is exactly what we do not want. And to help illustrate this uh, godly sorrow, we're going to go way back in the Old Testament into the book of Ezekiel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel is one of the main prophets, and we're going to be uh, going to chapter 18. And Ezekiel is one of the five major prophets found in the Old Testament. And so prophet is just one who speaks the word of God to the people. In chapter 18, it just starts off by saying, The word of the Lord came to me, me being Ezekiel. So here in chapter 18, we see that Ezekiel is speaking the word of the Lord. So whatever we we read here, we can know that the Lord God, Yahweh, has said this. Hmm. Now, I don't know about in your Bibles, but in my Bible, chapter 18, is subtitled, The Soul Who Sins Shall Die. That's a brutal subtitle. Hmm. That's a brutal subject to be talking about, especially since it starts off by saying, The word of the Lord came to me. So this is God saying, The soul who sins shall die. Hmm. And six times found in this chapter is it found seeing that sin leads to death. I'm just going to very quickly go through these uh, verses. Starting in verse 4, it reads, The soul who sins shall die. Mm. Verse 13, He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. Verse 18, at the end, He shall die for his iniquity. Verse 20, The soul who sins shall die. 
Verse 24. The treachery of what she is guilty and the sin he has committed, for them he shall die. Finally, verse 26. When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice, for the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Mm. So six times, six times in this chapter, this chapter alone, it reads, If we sin, surely we deserve death. Mm. And that is an absolute truth. We deserve mm. death when we sin. It says it six times, six times. So this is important to know. So that is part of godly sorrow, being sorry to God, sorry that uh, God hates sin. In the sin that we do, it deserves death. So we need to have a godly sorrow because we deserve death for what we do. Now the final step to true repentance is you have to actually turn away from the sin. Mm. Now I'm going to be honest, this is by far the hardest step to repentance. Mm. Step one, sin, that comes naturally. We don't need any practice at that at all, and we shouldn't. We should try to abstain from sin. But it's a natural process of repentance. The second step, godly sorrow. Yes, that takes a little bit of effort to truly feel sorry for what we've done to God and to others truly feel sorry because we deserve death as Ezekiel illustrated. We deserve death. In Romans 3.23 states, for the wages of sin is death, or actually for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. That's for Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death. We're going to read that later. But So that comes not so uh, easily. But the final step, by far the hardest, and you need to make your actions reflect the repentance. You're sinning, you're doing these actions, and the final step is you're actually going to turn away, and you're going to start doing good deeds in place of this bad deed, of this sin that's in your life. And again, it is hard. And we know that's hard because all of our Bible heroes, they have sinned. We saw the sin, we heard the sin through God's Word, the Bible, that each one of our heroes, they had sin. It's easy. But what makes a hero, what makes these people, these sinners, these evildoers, these wicked people, what makes them a hero is that they completed the process of repentance, friends. Mm -hmm. They completed the process of repentance. All three steps. The final step, the hardest, they reflected their actions of repentance. They turned away from the sin. So these... These people, these wicked people, they really are heroes. They really are heroes, even though today many of them would be in prison for life. But these are our heroes. These are the heroes we base our faith around. We base our faith around them because they repented. They repented of their sin. David, the selfish murderer, was a man after God's own heart. Abraham, the liar, made a covenant with God and is the father of God's chosen people. Mm. Jonah, the heartless one, spread the message to the Ninevites. Peter, the denier of Christ, his friend, was a crucial, was a crucial lead, early church leader. Mm. Amen. James, the half, the half brother of Jesus, the brother of Jesus, the doubter that he was the Christ. He was another crucial early church leader. Amen. Aaron, the idol maker, the idol maker to the God who is a jealous God and who hates idols. The idol maker Aaron. Hmm. He aided Moses in leading God's chosen people to the promised land. Paul, the mass murderer. He was a mass murderer. He persecuted those Christians. But Paul, the mass murderer, he was an important Christian forerunner. And wrote nearly half of the books of the New Testament. Amen. These are Bible heroes who sinned. And some of them sinned severely. My favorite Bible hero, David, an example, mm. had an affair with this woman. And to cover it up, he killed the man whose wife, or whose husband that was. That is an example of a severe sin. A sinner who would be in prison for life. 
But he is a hero. Why? Because he repented. He repented, and after he, he repented, he was described as being a man after God's own heart. That's a privilege. That's a privilege, being described as a man, being after God's own heart. I would love, in the end, in Judgment Day, for Jesus to tell me that I was a man after God's own heart. Amen. I would love to hear those words. And those words were described to a sinner. And why were they described to that sinner? It's because he repented. So these Bible heroes, they aren't heroes because they sin just like us. That's an ordinary, common thing to do. We all know that. We all sin. But these are heroes because they repented from their actions. And we base our faith around them now. Now we should all still be in Ezekiel chapter 18. And again... Ezekiel says six times, actually God says six times, that we deserve death when we sin. But I want to look at the end of chapter 18, starting in verse 30. It reads, Therefore I will judge you, Yahweh, a house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent, therefore, and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I, Yahweh, have no pleasure in the death of anyone. Hmm. So turn and live. So here we have God, after saying six times that we deserve death when we sin. Here we're saying that God, yes, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Hmm. But we read here in the closing verses of chapter 18 of the book of Ezekiel. He says, repent and turn from all your transgressions. And it reads, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. God wills that no one shall perish. Mm -hmm. God doesn't want us to die, but let me tell you, God does not leave the guilty unpunished. Mm -hmm. Amen. God says it himself. God describes himself in Exodus 34, 6, and 7 that he does not leave the guilty and punished. So let me assure you, if you don't repent, God will punish you. However, however, this is a positive spin. This is good news. We just haven't gotten there yet. The good news is that this repentance, this idea of repentance that we talked about, that was the core of Jesus and John the Baptist's ministry. That was the core throughout the Bible, really. And it's the core of our Bible heroes because they sinned, but they repented, and that's why they are heroes. Mm, amen. This idea of repentance, mm. it leads to eternal salvation. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 It's eternal salvation. Mm. To close, I would just want to read Romans 6.23. Mm -hmm. Found in the New Testament. And again, this is written by Paul, who Paul, again, was a mass murderer of mm. many Christians. Mm. But he repented on the road to Damascus, and that's why we have almost half of our New Testament today, because Paul, he repented. And so in Romans 6, 23, Paul writes, For the wages of sin is death. And that's the part that I hear a lot. A lot of people quote this. They say, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. However, they leave out the best part of this verse. The best part, it reads, but the free gift of God, the free gift is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we can receive this free gift if we repent from our sins. If we repent from from our sins, we can have the free gift of eternal salvation. It's the best gift that anyone could ever ask for. And these sinners, these Bible heroes, they were sinners. And sin, anyone who sins, we read in Ezekiel and here in Romans, anyone who sins, they deserve death. But I'm confident that the Bible heroes such as David 
and Abraham and Paul. I'm confident that they will not receive an eternal death. I'm confident that they will receive the free gift of eternal salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen again? Amen. amen. And this is the same offer that we have. So I just want you guys to know that yes, we deserve death, but this repentance, this idea of repentance, we can receive this gift of eternal salvation. And when we do that, we can be a great hero of the faith. We can be a hero if we repent from our sins. Amen. Amen.